Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Joan Reed. I'm Dean for Diversity and Community Partnership at Harvard Medical School and Professor of Medicine. I want to thank you for joining us today. There are over 700 registrants for our discussion on racism and violence impacting the Asian American community. And this uh, group of participants includes physicians, faculty, students, trainees, social workers, administrators from across multiple schools and community organizations. We come together today to highlight the impact of the pandemic on Asian, Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, the microaggressions and acts of violence committed on individuals, including our students, trainees and colleagues, and to discuss strategies to stand together with our colleagues in vulnerable communities against hatred, racism, and violence. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Harvard Medical School Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership, DICP. The mission of DICP is to advance diversity and inclusion in health, biomedical, behavioral, and STEM fields in ways that build individual and institutional capacity to achieve excellence, foster innovation, and ensure equity in health locally, nationally, and globally. DICP efforts support the career development of junior faculty, trainees, and students, identify and train leaders in academic medicine and health policy, and provide programs that address crucial pipeline issues. Today's webinar is offered through the DICP Equity and Social Justice Initiative, and it is the eighth ESJ webinar in the current academic year. In the fall of 2016, a planning committee comprised of faculty, staff, and students representing the Harvard Medical School community discussed the establishment of this equity and social justice series to address health disparities, social determinants of health, leadership, health system, health policy, and other areas affecting vulnerable populations. Since 2016, an average of 10 to 12 programs have been provided annually and in collaboration with HMS affiliated institutions. ESJ events focus on four areas. One, history and context. Two, culture and environment. Three, health disparities. And four, leadership and skill development. This year, the ESJ lecture series tackled health issues that often impact disadvantaged and vulnerable populations. And our conversations and speakers will address not just defining the disparity, but we'll also discuss interventions on a community hospital and policy level to address these inequities. A few housekeeping notes for today's session. Chat is not available. Your microphones will be muted, but you can use the Q&A to post your questions for the panelists. This webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the DICP website. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alden Landry, our moderator for today. He is an emergency medicine physician at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and is the founder of Motivating Pathways, Inc. Dr. Landry is an assistant professor of emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School and an assistant dean in the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership. I'm now going to turn this over to Dr. Landry. Thank you. Dr. Reed, thank you for the uh, introduction and thank you for um, your uh, leadership in this space as we continue to have these really tough discussions uh, related to issues around equity and social justice. Uh, I wanna say thank you to our panelists for joining us as well and to all the audience who are here joining us for this discussion. Uh, we originally started planning this discussion about three or, three or so weeks ago uh, as uh, we started to hear more and more incidences of hate um, and violence uh, being directed towards the Asian American community, um, in particular with uh, the shootings in Atlanta and the assault of the woman um, just walking down the street uh, in both San Francisco and in New York City. And I just wanna have, make sure that we're thinking about this conversation uh, as we recognize that um, hate and racism is unfortunately been embedded in uh, the culture and the climate of our country uh, since in, its inception. And uh, not to overlook the fact that just yesterday we saw a video, oh, excuse me, we heard reports of uh, another uh, black man murdered by police, uh, Dante Wright, uh, just outside of Minneapolis. And we saw footage of uh, a lieutenant in the US Army um, being assaulted by police 
um, for not pulling over quick enough. And so just to give a little backdrop as to how we're having these conversations, maybe I'd like to just take a minute uh, to uh, pause to think for 30 seconds and to reflect on everything that we've experienced as individuals uh, before we jump into this conversation. So just a quick 30 second or so uh, reflection. All right, thank you all for obliging me with that. With that, I honestly don't want to leave too much with the um, prelude and really want to turn it over to our panelists. Uh, so I'd like to introduce them now to be a part of this discussion. Uh, just as Dr. Reed mentioned, uh, the chat is closed. However, we will be trying to address as many questions from the audience as possible. So please be sure to use the Q&A session. Also, we will post contact information for our speakers uh, towards the end of the presentation so you can engage with them uh, in other spaces. And uh, lastly, at the very end of the panel, we will have a quick survey for you all to discuss uh, the impact of this uh, presentation and also uh, other issues that we may want to consider as parts of our discussion as part of the equity and social justice lecture series. With that, I want to introduce our amazing panelists. And I want to say thank you all before we even get started just for joining us and being in this space. Uh, first, I want to introduce Dr. Uh, Jacques Ambrose, who is a medical director of youth services at Beth Israel Leahy Behavioral Services. Next, Ms. Ezwita Tan Magori. Uh, she is an administrative director for the Mongan Institute and the director of the Disparity Solutions Center. And last, Dr. Niha Trin, uh, who is the director of Psychiatry Center for Diversity at Massachusetts General Hospital. And I wanna say uh, from a personal note, all three of these individuals I consider friends and it's been great to be able to engage all three of you via text message and emails to really just unpack these issues. And I'm glad that you're here to share uh, your thoughts and your feelings and your expertise as we have this really difficult conversation. And uh, again, thank you to all of us, uh, all of those joining us from across the country participating in this discussion. Uh, Dr. Trent, I wanna turn to you first uh, for our discussion. And my first question to you is uh, very simple. How do you feel when you learn about another instance of racism or violence against Asian Americans, particularly what happened uh, in Atlanta uh, and the attacks in New York City? And has your reaction changed uh, as all these reports about uh, Asian American hate have increased? Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Landry, for having me and Dr. Reed. And uh, it is a real honor to be here. I will say that um, what I speak on will be partly as a you know, as an individual, partly as a psychiatrist and someone who works in, in this field and is really committed to social justice. Um, I would say similar to stages of grief, you know, I, I was shocked. I was shocked. It's like shocked, but not shocked. Um, and I think that there is a sense of re-traumatization that often happens as an individual. So on one hand, the horrors, you know, you can't turn away from. I actually was sitting in my bed, my friends were paging, I mean, texting me and uh, blowing up my phone and saying, oh my gosh, did you hear what happened in Atlanta? And, you know, I really, as I hear about these things and I'm sure our audience can also commiserate that, uh, you know, you really have to take time for yourself. So I found myself taking time for myself and then also trying to process, trying to process with other people that I would consider my friends or members of the community. I was sort of reflecting, the last thing I'll say is, I was reflecting on this uh, idea of ring theory of grief um, that really helped me when I was processing my father's, my late father's passing a few years ago. This idea that, you know, for those who are most affected, say for instance, the death of a family, you know, those reverberations like a, pe a pebble uh, floating in a pond, uh, they kind of uh, reverberate outwards. And so I was fortunate not to be affected personally but as someone who identifies with that community, you know, I certainly felt, you know, years uh, of traumatic wounds sort of reopening as I try to make sense of it. And uh, I would love to hear from my panelists as well, uh, their reactions. Thank you, uh, Niha. Uh, the next question I have for you is, um, could you provide uh, some context to the history of hate and exclusion of Asian Americans in the United States? And how does that history manifest itself today in today's America? 
Absolutely. I already saw there was a Q&A. There was a question in the chat about this. And I would say that uh, your comment that racism is baked into our nation is really, that is just so, that's, that's it, you know. Um, when I think about, I'll, I'll comment on the process since I am a psychiatrist and I like to think about process as well as content that our country is just really not interested in understanding history. You know, we are really ahistoric as a country. Um, and we're also anti-intellectual and now we're bending towards even a resistance to agreeing on basic tenets of truth. And so on top of that, you have this history that's really hard to find um, you know, we haven't even grappled with our history of slavery in this country. And on top of that, you know, sort of this anti-Asian sentiment uh, is a part of that larger picture. You know, you can look uh, to the 1790s, there was this Immigration Act, which basically said the only people that could be citizens in the U.S. were white people of good character, literally. And on top of that, you know, the waves of anti-Asian sentiment started early. You know, with the gold rush and uh, you know people really being anti-Chinese because those workers who came to uh, toil and build the roadways, they were in the railways, they were really the you know the quote unquote proper US citizens really didn't like them and really just excluded them. First excluded in the Page Act, so excluded Chinese women who are assumed to be prostitutes, and that was the only reason why they were coming to this country. And then the Chinese Exclusion Act. So you know, we have hundreds of years of history um, of racism in this country founded on this idea of white supremacy. When I say white supremacy, it's an idea of a racial hierarchy. Um, and it was only until the 60s um, on the wave of uh, the civil rights movement that these laws, these laws to limit immigration from Asia, Africa, and other continents was lifted. Um, and then, you know, from there, um, Asians, they only let the quote unquote, educated Asians in initially, we were used as a wedge, a wedge. So the model minority myth emerged and we were then used as a community, as a wedge against uh, black and Latinx communities. You know, hey, how come the Asians are doing well? You know, it was used to justify uh, the legacy of inequity in this country. And so when I think about that and I think about the content and the fact that we are not good as a country of unearthing and really reckoning with our history, I think that as individuals, and later on we'll talk about this, we have a duty to learn our history and really examine and um, really uh, take a good look in the mirror to be able to move forward. Thank you for um, unpacking a little bit of the history that goes uh, into our country. I think it's really important for us to sort of reflect back about uh, how we got to where we are. And a lot of things are rooted in hatred and racism baked into laws. And we talk about how do we address um, uh, inequities? Well, part of it is revisiting the laws and the policies that were in place in our country uh, that led to the disparities. And so um, that's a place that many of us need to start. And I think knowing our history is really important and teaching our history uh, as a country, both the good and the bad is really important. Otherwise, uh, we just assume that the status quo uh, is the way it is um, and not really have an understanding of the repercussions of decisions that were made um, many years and decades and even centuries before before us. Uh, you know, and I just want to end with one question for you, Niha. Uh, how are Asian Americans responding to racism and violence toward their communities on an individual level? And then what are some examples or reactions um, of those individuals and communities um, to, to these issues? Um, and how can people be more, uh, be better allies for the Asian American community? And I know that's a loaded question. Um, yes, and I'll try to answer all of that in three minutes. Um, so the first is that regarding the reactions, right, they, they span the spectrum, right? It's sort of as, as we're grieving um, these horrific acts, we're all at different points of our own sort of racial uh, awareness and development, right? Uh, it's sort of a pre-call. I was talking to Suida and, you know, sort of thinking about, she and I have not really talked about these things. We've known each other for a long, long time, right? And so in some ways, similar to all the things in the pandemic, this brings a silver lining, an opportunity to sort of open the conversation where uh, we may have been reluctant to. Um, again, process mirrors content. So, you know, I know that for myself, uh, for many people in the community, you know, our, our goal is always to keep our heads down, 
right? You just work, you don't speak up. You know, there's apparently this Japanese saying, which I learned through this process that, you know, a nail that sticks out gets hammered down, right? And that kind of, you know, I think given the level of marginalization, the feeling of perpetual foreigner feeling and otherness, the AAPI community, we've always kind of, you know, shied away from this. And we're also complicit. We're complicit in wanting to climb that racial hierarchy and having some proximity to whiteness, to access to white spaces that other uh, black and brown communities haven't had. Right? And at the same time, you know, Sweetie said, well, if we're doing so well, where are we in the C-suite? Where are all the CEOs, right? And so we clearly have this mo uh, sort of, uh, I've heard this term, a middleman minority kind of status. So we are uncomfortable. I've seen, however, a uh, tremendous amount of solidarity um, over the last year with the movement for Black Lives and sort of thinking about us as a community. You know, the, I, I speak from the refugee Vietnamese community. Many of us now are my age, getting gray hairs and maybe a little bit more bold. And so we're starting to speak out. And I would say as, as far as being allies, you know, um, people have, have just been really amazed by the outpouring of support, people just checking in, hey, I have just wanted to let you know I'm thinking about you, you know, how can I get involved? There are a lot of organizations that are starting to move forward that are part of the AAPI community. I was pleased to wake up to the Boston Globe and see a couple of editorials from prominent members of the AAPI community in Boston. So there are lots of ways to get involved and happy to share those resources at the end or in a follow-up. Thank you, Dr. Trin, for uh, your thoughts. Um, I next want to turn to uh, Azwita Tanragori. Uh, Azwita, um, you know, as we have known each other for a long time, we have some really candid conversations. Um, and I think that uh, it's, I, I'm really excited to, to have you here as a part of this panel and to share your, your thoughts, um, because I know our conversations on uh, via text message have been really interesting around this space. Um, I, but I want to start with you a, a question more around uh, data, and uh, I think it's something that we maybe need to anchor ourselves in a little bit better. Um, so how accurately are Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders um, population st statistics represented in sociology and demo uh, demography? Uh, and does that data show a different story than what the reality is? And could it be contributing to the societal misconceptions around Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders? Uh, yeah, thank you, Alden. And, and actually, your discussion about texting reminded me that it's really important for us as people of color to support each other. And there's been many times when you've done that in me, like being able to text when a microaggression has happened, or I observed something and I said to you, oh my God, this just happened because I knew that you would be able to reciprocate that. But I realized that I really didn't identify anybody who I could text about this. And in fact, this webinar feels a little high stakes to me because I'm so used to talking about disparities in terms of other folks, not myself. And so I'm like really almost nervous about what can I say, but also aware of emotionally how I feel. I would just say around data, you know, we've done a lot of work around data and let me be clear, the best data that we have in this country is on black and Latinx folks. Without a doubt, we work with CMS and that's the categories that have the most data. And unfortunately, the way that we are, we're very data driven. And so the number one thing that you always hear is show me the data and I'll believe that there's a problem. But the problem is there is no data. There's not good data on uh, um, Asians in this country. And because we like to lump everybody together and we don't ever disaggregate and we talk about the size is too small for us to look at it. We never get into the details. And as I always say, the devil is in the details. And so we get these sort of broad assumptions that Asian Americans are doing really well. People think they're all doing like me, right? Like I have a suit, I'm in a nice office. And the truth is if you, if you disaggregate Asian Americans um, by groups, there's huge disparities. Um, and, and so there is this misinformation that we are assuming that the folks that are doing the best represent the entire group, right? We're not, we're not even speaking the same language. I would say between the three of us on this panel, none of us spoke the first same language. So, but yet we are pulled together and I feel certain kinship with the two of them because we have the same experience. 
regardless of where we come from. Um, same thing with education, right? There's huge disparities if you disaggregate by group, but because if you lump it all together, it seems like we're really well educated. People use that as a way to say they're doing fine. There are no disparities. So we do need to look into this deeper. And actually, this is a problem. I looked into it. Um, there's not a lot of surveys that actually um, report out on Asians because the number is too small or because they don't do surveys in anything other than English and Spanish. So here at Mass General, Mass General Brigham, we recently, just recently in the last year, rolled out a patient survey that actually is in multiple languages. Before that, it was English and Spanish only. So there's a lot of work to be done. And unfortunately, everybody always wants to see the data before they do action. And, and this is a problem that we have. And it definitely contributes to us thinking there isn't a problem. Uh, thank you for that. And it's interesting that you um, you talk about the data and maybe we can unpack that a little bit more because you and I have had conversations around, um, you know, sort of mass lumping of Asian Americans into data sets and how that uh, can potentially skew the information that you get. And then those surveys that you often talk about on the quality of care that patients uh, report receiving from their hospitals uh, and how the, the, the end may be too small um, to, to really assess the data or excuse one way and we interpret it another. So I think there's a lot to, to unpack there. Um, I, I wanna turn uh, uh, the question a little bit different. Um, as you, um, Niha did a great job, Dr. Tran did a great job of presenting um, this discussion from a historical perspective, talking about you know, what happened in the 1800s and 1900s in our, in our country uh, related to um, uh, disparities in, in, in Asian hate. Uh, but a lot of um, this Asian hate has bubbled up uh, because of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I, from your perspective, what you're seeing in your role, uh, has COVID-19 exacerbated any health disparities? Um, either, and then also has it uh, exacerbated any other societal uh, disparities um, that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders may be experiencing? Yeah, we have to think about the intersectionality of this group. Um, you know, a large part of this group has come to this country as immigrants. And so this anti-immigrant sentiment that leadership has sort of advocated for in this country, um, and then you cross it with sort of the anti-Asian sentiment against COVID, because of COVID and just looking for a scapegoat, um, you know, those contribute to Asians not feeling welcome in our institutions. And so we did see actually a lot of Asians at the beginning of the surge not seeking medical care because they were afraid that they would be blamed for causing COVID, right? Um, and then there is also the language barrier, thinking about like having interpreters who can speak the language, who can provide the care. And we know this is a challenge in our, in our healthcare systems. So I would just say, you know, the outright sort of hostility and the bystander, I think is really disturbing. Um, just this, you know, the one video of the elder Asian being attacked and then the guy just closing the door on the building to me was heartbreaking. Uh, and I think this happens a lot. And I think between the three of us, we probably have lots of stories to tell both for patients, but our family members and ourselves where we know they were treated a certain way. And I think the biggest problem that we have in our community um, that we ourselves can probably work on more is just the silence that we have where we don't talk like Miha said, like she and I have not talked about it. Um, this morning, I was standing in school with another parent who's also Asian, and we sort of hesitantly talked about it. And I just think we're not in practice to talk about this in a way that maybe the Black community or even the Latinx community is very good at sort of talking about this. And so when there's a silence in healthcare and among ourselves, if there's a silence, people assume there's nothing there. And so I think the disparities are part of it is sort of the lack of data, what is nationally said by leadership and then also like our own sort of apprehension about voicing our opinions on this. Uh, thank you for that answer and I, I and I could speak from a clinical perspective um, when uh, the pandemic hit uh, a year ago uh, and uh, individuals uh, who identified as Asian American were coming into our emergency department um, oftentimes they were apologizing to me uh, for being in the emergency department um, and um, felt guilt um, because of the way that the virus is being 
um, perpetuated um, in, in society uh, and more particularly by our leadership. And I think what we have to really think about is that um, you know, the reason why uh, many uh, Asian Americans uh, fell victim to COVID-19 early on uh, were the same reasons why Black Americans and the Latinx community were also uh, suffering greatly from the pandemic because of uh, the issues related to uh, being uh, essential workers and also um, living in multi-generational houses uh, and just the overall the higher exposure uh, to the virus uh, because of the social determinants or social drivers of health. Um, and that's something that we have to keep in mind um, and here in our country uh, as we think about COVID-19 and the pandemic. One last question for you, uh, Ezwita. Um, how well does society understand or acknowledge the complexity of disparities um, that Asian Americans are facing? And uh, are our leaders, uh, both in uh, hospitals in healthcare, uh, and in healthcare uh, and in politics, equipped to tackle these issues? No, they're not. I mean, I think there needs to be a lot of education that happens. I see this when we look at patient satisfaction surveys and their Asians rank MGH, for example, lower uh, in, um, across all and for con uh, several years. And, you know, I think the model minority here is very, myth is very damaging to this because I think people's perception and bias, honestly, this is about bias, is that Oh, well, maybe they didn't understand the questions. I have heard people say that. Or, well, they have really high standards. So they're gonna rank the care as not great even when it's fairly good. Instead of just accepting the data for what it is and then acting on it. So I do think we need to educate our leaders about this challenge. And it's very complex as racism is. And I think people just want an easy answer. And so they're gonna go for the thing that to them feels comfortable, which is Asians are doing really well. They're hard workers. Uh, they're very you know, community centered and, and, and just ignore everything else. So I think we can do a better job as leaders of just highlighting this plight and being very responsive but also on a very personal level, I think we need to engage with our colleagues better on these topics. You don't have to come out with like the perfect word or sentence or sentiment, but it has to feel authentic and it has to feel, you know, true to, to the person. Yeah, and I think at some point as we do, I think we need to really unpack um, the ways that um, we all can be uh, allies and upstanders as opposed to um, you know, sending out a well-crafted email saying thoughts and prayers. And I think we need to, you know, really push ourselves to uh, be more in this space uh, with those who are victims um, of violence uh, and, and, and hate and microaggressions and all of these things that we're talking about. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you, Azwita, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, next, I want to turn to uh, Dr. Ambrose. Uh, Dr. Ambrose, um, I want to bring you into discussion. And I wanted you to just start off with a personal note and could you share with us uh, your personal experience as an Asian American living in the United States over the past year? What are you feeling and how are you coping? Hello, everyone. And thank you so much, Dr. Landry and Dr. Reed, for giving me the opportunity to kind of talk a little bit about some of these ongoing issues. Um, I think kind of reflecting a little bit about my experience living in the U.S., um, collectively, and I think within the past years, it has been really interesting. And I think similar to what Dr. Trin mentioned when I initially heard about some of the tragic and really blatant and overt events of racism towards the Asian and Asian American communities recently, I, I think grief was the predominant feeling. And then I think of my own family and then my mom, and I just got really anxious, fearful, and a little angry. And I think that's the insidious act of, of this racial terrorism is, is that pervasive fear um, and anxiety that you, you don't know what's going to happen as you're someone who resemble that community. And I think everyone in our, our communities felt a little bit of that in some, some way. And it's, it's kind of a pervasive form of communal trauma. And I think personally, growing up in Hawaii, uh, where, where Asian, Asian Americans, as well as Pacific Islanders were the predominant group, I was definitely a little bit insulated from some of the blatant um, verbal vitriols that um, folks experience. 
So I think when I when it came to the the, the continental U.S. for for school, I, I still remember the first time that I got called a, a chink by a patient, and I think my first experience was just confusion because I, I wasn't Chinese, I wasn't Chinese American, um, and I think over time it made me realize like it it doesn't necessarily matter what out constitution and our composition racially is it's whatever people perceive us as and that's how they're going to treat us and it's about kind of creating this tiny tiny little box where you fit into that box regardless of wherever you come from or what ethnic makeup makeup you have if people see you as this they're going to treat you like this and i think it's it's sobering. I think it's it's a very sobering experience. And professionally, as a child psychiatrist, within the past year, I've seen like this sharp, very noticeable increase in both covert, so some of the microaggressions that the other panelists has talked about, um, as well as some of the bullying, and the overt um, incidents of racism in my patient population. So within the last month alone, I had a couple of recently immigrated students who talked about just completely feeling so anxious speaking up in class or, speak, or, or asking questions in class because they feel like their accents were like, too strong and, and they were feeling self, self-conscious self about the, the way that they speak because in the past, their accents had been just miserably mocked by their peers. Um, I had a college student talking about his egg being, his car being egged. And uh, there, there was like another youth that talked about having just severe panic attacks whenever he goes into the grocery stores because he worried that people would just like attack him. And it's, it's, it's really, really heartbreaking because in every single one of these cases, when we're talking about it, all of them said that they, they didn't really report it to their, their, their school or their colleges because they felt like they were the only one who experienced it. And I think it, it really breaks my heart because it's, it's, it's a double pain. Like you have to experience the, the impact of the, the racist acts and then you feel like you're the only one who experienced it. It feels very isolating and it feels very like you're, you're the only one. So I'm, I'm very grateful for having this communal space because it highlights that, no, you are so far from being the only one who experienced these kind of, uh, of incidents. Yeah, thank you for, for sharing, uh, Jacques. And, you know, I, I just remember walking into a clinical shift a couple of weeks ago, um, and um, I was working with a, a resident uh, who's Asian American, and she, um, walked over to me and just asked to talk um, because she was having some of these um, issues and uh, within you know a matter of hours in our shift in the emergency department she was reporting back some of the comments that were being said to her while she was trying to deliver care for patients. I just think we need to really understand the, the, the composition and the toll that this can take on an individual um, and so thank you for sharing your story and, and, and sharing the story of others that you're hearing. Um, and I just want to highlight, you know, one of the things that we're doing, and, and this is uh, me taking a little bit of personal privilege as moderator, because we're having this discussion. One of the things that we're doing is we're monitoring the discussion that's going on and the questions uh, that are coming in from the audience. And there's a lot of even vitriol in the comments and the questions that people who are viewing this webinar are, 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 are uh, presenting to us. And so I just think that that's the space that we're at in America where everything has to be challenged uh, when that isn't necessarily the case. We're trying to have honest uh, conversations with individuals uh, who are sharing their their experiences, who are sharing their expertise. Um, but even now, uh, in a place like this, we're we're, we're seeing challenges um, to what people are reporting back as real, and what we see on the news uh, playing out, and what we have the data to show. Um, so there was a, a comment made by uh, Dr. Tran earlier. We've talked about this in the past, uh, Dr. Ambrose. Um, and it's something that uh, uh, you all as panelists felt we needed to discuss. And so I wanted to open the floor up to you to talk about how the perception of Asian Americans as being the model minority has come into play uh, in all of this and how it's impacting uh, disparities. And are things changing or, or going in different directions? 
Thank you so much for for bringing that topic up for for us to discuss because I think it's such a such an insidious concept um, because at at the forefront it it sounds positive it sounds like oh wow like you're 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 being viewed in a, a somewhat positive way like why why are you complaining and I think the the underpinnings of model minority implies that Asians and Asian Americans. Are not underprivileged racially or ethnically um, because of their economic success compared to other racial groups, and thus Asians and Asian American communities do not merit any resources or any attention um, as an ethnic minority group within the the, the U.S. And then on the flip side of that, um, the the model minority stereotype I think underscore the fact that. Any other minorities who are not overperforming, who are not doing successfully, um, they are either lazy, they're not doing their part, they're not doing all the things that the, the Asian and Asian communities have been doing. And therefore, it creates this artificial wedge, uh, to use one of the words that the other panelists had mentioned, this really, really dark wedge between Asian and Asian American communities and other ethnic minority groups. And I think this is really, really insidious because like historically, looking at the way that the, the model minority stereotype was conceptualized, that was developed around the same time as the Black Power movement of the 1960s and 70s. So we're, we're looking at this almost as like, um, a white supremacist respond to the notion that the Black Power movement was challenging at the time is that America was fundamentally a racist society and it was structured that way to keep minorities in a subordinate position. So the model minority almost emerged as a response to say that actually, no, if you behave in this way, you can perform well in the US and it's really toxic because I think within our own communities, um, there are a lot of us who buy into that and believe that if I just work hard, um, if I just do all these things, I will be able to obtain success, power, or whatever it is. And it takes away from the conversation that we should be having is why is this fundamentally almost like racial hierarchy and power hierarchy in the US still existing? And why is it that we're at the bottom? Um, and it's it's very hard and I think uncomfortable for a lot of folks in our communities and I'll, I'll include myself into that. It's like initially I think it's very difficult for me to break away from that norm because speaking out from it, um, pointing it out and challenging it, then you're calling attention to yourself and you're calling um, ne almost negative attention to yourself and that in a way concurrently breaks you from the model minority and now you're not in, in a positive light. So it, it, it concurrently serves as like a disincentive for people within that community to challenge it and talk about it. So I think it's in, incredibly insidious. Thank you uh, for unpacking that for us, uh, Jock. And I have one, one last question for you before I try and address some questions that are coming from the audience. And then also a couple of, of points that I really wanted to make sure that we are um, um, I was thinking about based off of uh, conversations uh, that, um, that you all have presented thus far. And so my last question to you is, how has COVID-19 impacted the mental health is, uh, of individuals, specifically focusing on the Asian American community? As we'd already mentioned about uh, the health disparities that are being exacerbated because uh, individuals from the Asian American community may not be seeking care at the same rates. Uh, but what about from a mental health perspective, have you seen anything? Definitely. And I think, like I mentioned, some of the examples of my, my own patient population, I think, is emblematic of um, what we're currently seeing in, in Boston. And Boston is one of the more liberal cities out there. Um, and I think one of the reasons why we're seeing this more overt display of racism towards um, Asian and Asian American communities is, is multiple folks. One, like from the very top, we had a prior US president calling COVID time and time again, the China virus or the China flu. And it's almost like an implicit verbal permission from the very top of our country saying that this is okay to say. 
Um, and I recognized that COVID had caused a lot of hurt, suffering for a lot of people. And the COVID virus itself is very nebulous and very abstract. So it, I think it's hard for people to target that. So when the rhetoric of the China virus or the Kung flu came out, it became a lot easier for people to displace that anger, displace that hurt onto a very concrete, tangible target. That's the Asian and Asian American communities. And I'm, I'm pointing this out, not necessarily to excuse the behavior, but for, for everyone in our communities and for many of my patients who have posed this question, like, why is it happening to me? Like, why is, why is this anger, this hatred targeted towards me? And I think this is one part of it. Second, I wanted to share this, this story that completely changed the way that I look at my own racial identity, um, as well as my experiences in the US. And it's a story about Fred Korematsu. So during World War II, um, that there was an uh, executive order from FDR that effectively rounded up everyone of Japanese ancestry in the, in the United States. And there was like over 110,000 people who were interned. And most of them were born in the US. And Fred um, Korematsu was a civil rights activist who was born in Oakland, California. So he was American born, um, ended up suing the US because of this injustice. And he talked about the experience of being in the camps as um, the, the camps being surrounded by barbed wire, there were military police armed with rifles, and that they were stationed on top of the lookout towers looking down at them. And he wrote that these camps are definitely an imprisonment under armed guards with instruction to shoot to kill um, when he was writing to, to his lawyer. And this is really important because initially, when he tried to combat this injustice and he tried to sue the US government, um, many people in his own communities didn't support him and even ostracize him for his actions. And how this relates to the events that are currently happening to us is that in 2014, um, the late uh, Justice Antonia Scalia talked about the, the Supreme Court decision, Korematsu versus the US, saying that it was wrong, but it was never overturned. So, and he said that you are kidding if you think the same thing will not happen again. Um, it's no justification, but that's the reality. And, and in 2016, one of the, the, the spokesperson for a super PAC that supported um, President Trump's election argued that the Japanese internment of 1942 actually set a constitutional precedent for the proposed registry of the Muslim um, immigrants at the time. And I, I'm, to kind of tie everything in, I bring up this story because of two things. One, I think it underscores the discriminations and the connectedness of these discrimination for all minorities in this country. Like racism may look differently, but it's still racism. And I think it's very important about how we as a community come together to move forward as an anti-racist movement and anti-racism movement. And I think it's very tempting for us, for me, for, for anyone to say that, well, right now racism doesn't really affect me or racism doesn't affect me that badly. So I don't want to stir the pot. But the problem is the pot has always been stirred, like um, Dr. Landry mentioned, since the foundation of this country. So we have to speak up. And then two, for Asian and Asian American communities, I think it underlies this insidious psychology, again, that we are always foreigner. Asians and Asian Americans are always viewed as a foreigner, and therefore we're not Americans. And I wonder if that comes into play um, as some of these incidents um, and racist acts that are acted on the Asian communities are being viewed in a societal lens and viewed by the media as a whole. And I, I want to commiserate a little bit with some of the Asian cultural norms of wanting to be more preserved, more, more introverted, and turning inward. And I want to encourage folks to a, examine it and be pushed against that because how is it that the racist structures and white supremacy are actually playing into that. 
and the mono minority paradigm that we're still living with today is, I think, a clear example of how that, that is a part of our heritage now in the U.S. Doc, uh, I don't know how to follow that. That was just really <laughs> um, solid. Uh, and thank you for just really making me think about these issues um, in, in, in a different way. So thank you for, for that really well thought out answer. Um, I actually want to open up the question to all of the panelists, and I want to go back to you, as we Asweeta, for my first question. Um, as we have these conversations um, around um, bystander and upstander training uh, and having to explain, you know, the experiences of uh, different communities uh, and how they have dealt with racism, um, both from a historical perspective and also from an individual perspective, I honestly get tired of having to uh, be the black translator for individuals um, for their uh, for my experiences and the experiences of others. And I'm sure you may feel the same way um, uh, as an Asian American woman. Um, but can you talk a little bit more, maybe give some some points um, or maybe toss out some some uh, areas for for discussion about how others can be involved in this space as bystanders, as allies, uh, as opposed to us always having to be the explainer of our, of, of, of our uh, experiences in this country. Yeah, um, I would just say, you know, I think the number one thing that we are all trying to do is just be comfortable in these discussions and that's the wrong approach. There is no, there is no way to talk about this that isn't going to ruffle some feathers, make people upset, you know, have some touch some sore points on folks. And so I would just say like the bystander piece, you know, I have this poster in, in my office that I used during a march or a kneeling that we did uh, at Mass General last summer. And it's really, it says like, get uncomfortable. And so what I mean by this is when you are in a, in a situation where somebody makes a remark that you know is a microaggression, don't wait for the Asian person to call them out because what I'm doing is I'm processing that that just happened. And I don't necessarily have the emotional bandwidth to then also tell you in a very non-emotional professional voice that you really just did something that was completely wrong. I would have preferred if one of my colleagues had stepped in and felt like, hey, can we take a moment out? Like, or even if you took the time out after the meeting to talk to me or talk to that person, that would have been great. Or even in our family situation. So I think we need to be more comfortable about speaking out for others who are experiencing racism. You know, not just relying on people to raise their hand and be like, I'm sorry, can we just stop for a moment? Because what I heard was really awful about myself. It's like, we need to be comfortable the way that I would speak out for a black colleague or a colleague who doesn't speak English very well, or for uh, American Indian colleague, like that's wrong. Like we need to get comfortable doing that. And I don't think that we are. And it's hard because we're, we, the three of us, the four of us, the five of us, we're all in an academic medical uh, um, setting where I think, you know, being professional and being very like, educated and 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 saying the right things is sort of so valued that we don't think about the pain that we're causing our colleagues by the silence so an, an acute example is when i'm in a room and i'm the only person who's asian and everybody else in the room is white with one other colleague who's person of color and we're talking about why asian patients don't rate the care at mass general very well and somebody says oh well maybe they didn't understand the question i think why would you say that in front of me? Well, you think all Asians don't speak English very well? <laughs> what, what, and so is that a dismissive piece then? Like, so we shouldn't actually care about these questions because they probably didn't understand the questions. There's a lot to unpack there, but like in the moment, like you cannot rely on me to call that person out because I'm just busy processing. So I think the same things that we have done, and I think Asians need to do it for other groups as well, but we all need to work together to support each other and to, to call out those things, you know, and get uncomfortable. So that, that would be my, my call to all of you. Um, you know, it's great that we're having this panel and two of the individuals that are joining us are uh, psychiatrists, and I think they bring an interesting lens to this discussion. And so I want to turn to both uh, Dr. Uh, Trin and Dr. Ambrose um, to, for this question. You know, um, it's not uncommon for uh, 
uh, families to be walking down the street and uh, hear um, an anti-Asian slur uh, being yelled. Um, and one of the victims in these um, attacks are often children. And we don't have that discussion about how this may be impacting children. So maybe can you unpack a little bit about how this may be impacting children at an early age, but then also more importantly, what adults can do to support those children when they hear that comment, uh, like what you experienced, uh, uh, Jacques, when you first came to the United States and you were called uh, a racial slur. Dr. Ambrose, you're the child and adolescent psychiatrist, <laughs> so I'm leading on you. <laughs> Um, I, uh, I mean, I, I think it's it's, it's such a, a complex answer because the because there's so much intermix into it. Um, I think the challenge is it, it it then goes back into the the prior conversation that Aswita was saying is like it's when these things are happening, um, it's happening toward a particular targeted community. And it's always feels like it is that community's response then to kind of do the healing, to do all of the, the, the taxes, the, the minority taxes involved with responding um, and doing all this X, Y, and Z. And I think there's a lot to be said about how do we, as the, the larger we, we as a society, we as a country, we as people who are not Asian, not Asian Americans respond collectively to any of these acts of racism because it hurts us all as a country. Um, it weakens us all as a country because it, I mean, like the, 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 the model of the US is like from many one, right? So if there's any fracturing of any of the individual part, it makes us a weaker place, a weaker country. And I think to respond a, a little bit more directly for, for racist acts that are targeted towards children, I think this is a very, very touchy space for me because I think growing up, like I, I experienced a lot of that like as, a, as an Asian person, a Pacific Islander person, as a Hispanic person, it's, it's just like whatever people want to see you at, like they'll throw that at you. And I think as a child, you don't necessarily understand why this, this hatred is coming from a person you don't even know, you didn't do anything to them. Um, so I think for the parents and the guardians and the community, one of the first thing, the for, foremost first thing that I would recommend is to really insulate and recontextualize that, that that is something totally outside of you. Like we don't have control over what other people do, but what we can control is how it lands when it receives within us and also how to contextualize that. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, like I am sure many of our panelists have been asked like, where are you from? No, where are you really from? And it becomes like almost like a, a running joke. And at the same time, like we don't necessarily see a lot of us reflected in the popular media. Like when Crazy Rich Asians came out, that was like the first major Asian and Asian American movie that has like non-Kung Fu actors. Um, and it was really kind of stark and striking for me because it, it's a reflection of how society views our community. And I think what we can do within our community is strengthen and bolstering, bolstering um, our, our basis. And at the same time, I think it, it is a responsibility that is shared among everyone. Um, I went on a soliloquy for way too long, Dr. Trent. <laughs> It was amazing. It was amazing. I couldn't have said it better, number one. Number two, thank you so much for reminding us about our values and our country and certainly what uh, we aspire to, at least. Uh, the only thing I would add to that, sort of building on both your comment as well as the sweetest comment, is that, you know, I try to practice in advance. You know, don't wait until the fire is burning, uh, burning your house down to have an exit route. So I always think about what are the quick things that I can do or say to be an upstander in any kind of situation. I'm not very articulate when I'm angry or mad. So I'll often say, excuse me, did you really say that? Or just give someone a look and let them kind of, you know, from my emotional reaction, get a sense of what I'm worried about. For children in particular, of course, we worry about their safety if something like that happens. And so um, making sure that child, adult, you know, these things trigger the inner child in me that was uh, ridiculed as a child. So just to say, are you okay? get the person to a safe area, ask them if they're okay, 
you know, be empathic. You know, it's interesting, Layla Saad in her book, White, Me and White Supermancy says, if you kicked a stranger by mistake on the subway, passing them by, you would say initially, very quickly say, I'm so sorry, are you okay? Or if you saw someone else getting physically hurt. And why are we so reluctant to address those um, emotional uh, wounds that are often can be invisible, which can be even more harmful and pernicious. Uh, but yes, it's everyone's responsibility. Thank you for that answer. Uh, and I do wanna just do a small uh, plug for an event that we're gonna be having as part of the uh, uh, um, DICP. We have a future discussion on discussing structural racism with children, a strategy to promote social justice and health equity. Uh, it's gonna be uh, led by Dr. Kimberly uh, Narian uh, from uh, the David uh, Geffen School of Medicine. And that's gonna be on Friday, April 30th at 1 p.m. Uh, we will send out registration links if you all are interested in joining that discussion. Um, I see that we're running short on time and I actually have two questions that I wanted to pose. One was um, a, a comment uh, that you just made, uh, Dr. Trend. Uh, and the second question will be for you, um, um, Azwita. So um, the first question is very quickly, um, as we are uh, in this space, we are in uh, academia, academia, there's trainees, there's fellows, uh, and they're all working under um, individuals um, who are faculty, who may be senior in their, in their positions, and they may, may say, say something uh, inappropriate. How do you encourage your trainees, those who are in vulnerable positions, to respond to this question? And I know it's a loaded question, um, and unfortunately, we don't have much time to try and answer that one. That's a really important question. And one I grapple with, I would say for the trainees out there, the students, you know, who are the faculty members that you can trust? You really feel like you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about this. Number two, are there ombuds people at your institution at HMS? There are, it's amazing ombuds office uh, that you can talk with confidentially. And then also think about some of the institutional policies that you can lean on uh, in terms of reporting, anonymous reporting and that kind of thing, but really, um, we often say our cliche in our residency program is don't worry alone. So really don't hold that by yourself. Really talk to your colleagues, your classmates, your friends and trusted uh, faculty. Great. And then very last uh, question for you, Azwita. Um, and I think this is just something may maybe others can maybe take home from this discussion. Uh, how do you make sure that you feel safe on a day in and day out basis? Oh boy. Um, well, there's safe, like physical safe, and there's emotional safe. I would say the physical safe is probably easier, right? Like I literally pick up the phone and call my mother and tell her not to leave the house because she's tiny, she's 70, and I worry about she's an obvious like target. Um, but I think the emotional safety is harder. And I would just say having um, friends in the room that you have had an open dialogue about these issues is really helpful and just processing that. And I think we need to do more of that. I think we need to come together as a community and support each other. Um, so I, I just, I think there needs to be more discussions and more transparency in these discussions. You know, I've had a lot of discussions with my colleagues about it. I've talked about like what it look, feels like to me when you don't say anything about the Atlanta shooting two, three, four days after it happens, that says a lot and it hurts me. And I can't even articulate that to you, but I need to, so that you understand that this is, that you are part of this, right? It's not just some system. It's not just the president. It is like all of us. So I would just end with that. It's just understanding that all of us have a role in this. Wonderful. Um, I just want to say thank you to our panelists um, for being in this space. And I know it was um, tough to try and answer some of these questions. And um, again, uh, thank you for, for sharing this. And I consider you all even more uh, closer friends after this experience. So uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Ambrose, Dr. Trin, uh, this uh, Tamara Gori, thank you for joining us. I just want to say thank you to Dr. Reed for her leadership again in this space. Uh, and also to uh, Ms. Jasmine so, uh, uh, Stecker, who's been behind the scenes uh, helping to organize this panel. Uh, we do have just a quick list of other events that the DICP will be hosting uh, coming up. We have a lot of events that are happening. Please uh, check out our website uh, to learn about more information uh, for these events and to register for these events. And if you would like to uh, fill out this very quick survey uh, that we have, uh, please click through the four or five questions that we have 
Um, and uh, we want to say thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. Um, please take uh, some of the lessons learned that you've um, heard from this um, uh, hour webinar and take it back to your work, take it back to your home, uh, and take it back uh, to help us as a country start to move in a direction, as uh, Dr. Ambrose said, uh, is more of an anti-racist society as we as we heal from all of these issues. Thank you again.